Hello, my name is Eric Ramirez, and on behalf of our working group, I wanted to begin by uh, thanking the organizers of this conference for all of the, the hard work that's been going on beside, behind the scenes to make this uh, conference possible. We really appreciate the opportunity to, to share some of, the, some of the latest fruits of our research um, and our proposal for this ethical code for commercial virtual reality and augmented reality applications. The format for our presentation will be as as we go throughout different members of our work group will, will present uh, on on certain aspects of the work and then uh, we look forward to engaging all of you in a fruitful discussion with uh, questions and and or um, continued continued discussion. So in making an ethical code for um, commercial VR and AR applications, we wanted to first establish some goals beforehand um, and draw on in-house research of the moral psychology of simulated experience in order to um, create an ethical code that we thought aligned with like the uniqueness of VR and, and AR. And so we want to ex examine the multidisciplinary literature on VR and AR, such as that from like psychology, philosophy, and neuroscience to identify areas where further intervention was needed, we thought, in terms of taking moral precautions on behalf of the user. Um, so we want to propose a revised code of ethics for these applications, and we wanted to expand beyond traditional content privacy and safety that might be involved in normal um, standard media and video games. Um, and we want to take in concerns that are unique to VR and AR, um, especially in regards to simulated experiences, such as the ability to distinguish between reality and virtual reality, which can lead to um, derealization and dissociation, especially in terms of young children and cognitive development. So VR, especially in the past 10 years, has had an incredibly evolving landscape and it's gone beyond just traditional games and entertainment, and it's kind of expanded to other um, life enriching aspects of um, media and video games, such as PTSD treatment and therapy of phobias, such as the uh, Plank experience, which is healing phobia of height, I think. And then there's also artistic pursuits that have been made in applications, such as Tilt Brush, where you can design in like a 3D um, space. And then it's also been used for historical and educational um, applications, like visiting the Anne Frank House, and then also tourism and visiting what would look like um, when you walked around on other planets, such as Access Mars by NASA. Before performing our research and formulating our new code of ethics, we referenced the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, or IEEE's code of ethics. IEEE is the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. They have an extensive list of tenets promoting the use of technology for the common good, one of them being to improve the understanding by individuals and society of the capabilities and societal implications of conventional and emerging technologies. The Association for Computing Machinery, or ACM, is the world's largest educational and scientific computing society, delivering resources that advance computing as a science and profession. As one of the most highly regarded professional and technical organizations in the world, one of ACM's goals is to ensure that the public good is the central concern during all professional computing work. They also encourage recognition when a computer system is becoming integrated into the infrastructure of society and adopt an appropriate standard of care for that system and its users. So we think that the existing codes are really useful starting points for establishing a good ethical code um, in the designing of VR and AR applications. And we wanted to take it a step further in terms of um, protecting the welfare and health and safety of the public and also the like privacy of the individual um, in terms of looking at it at what is unique to the ethical risks and factors that are introduced in VR and AR, such as um, like the heightened impact of jump scares or more emotional reactions that are inspired as a result of more realistic experience that may go beyond traditional movies and games and video games. 
Um, and we want to go beyond um, the current publications and explain why and how the decisions of game designers affect the user experience of the game and why that should be taken into consideration in the design. And we hope to incorporate and systemize the current codes um, from all different types of VR and AR video game manufacturers so that they're more easily um, accessible and understood across the VR and AR industry. There are certain features of VR and AR experiences which lend themselves to a deeper investigation of the way that users interact with the medium. A central tenet of immersive experiences is what is known as presence, which is the ability to convince users that they are physically located inside the virtual worlds instead of wherever they happen to be in reality. This strong sense of presence is responsible for virtually real experiences, which are treated by users in the moment to be real. Perspectival fidelity and context realism are two of the main factors that play into creating experiences which allow users to feel this presence. Perspectival fidelity is the structural part of this, meaning that it's not dependent on the content itself, but rather the way in which the user experiences the content. In other words, the way the user interacts with the medium. In traditional forms of media like television or films, users experience the content as being contained by a screen within the larger field of view of the user. VR doesn't have this limitation. Neither does AR, which allows the experience to be superimposed on reality. When developing VR and AR experiences, there are certain design features that make simulations more perspectively faithful than others. First-person human perspective being accurately represented, such as in this kayaking experience, um, as opposed to in this next slide, where uh, the first-person human perspective is not as accurately represented as it's not in the first person. The environmental cues and sounds being diegetic, meaning that they emanate from the story world of the experience. In this case, something like the sound of the kayak on the water, or maybe the birds chirping above. The hardware not getting in the way of the experience so that immersion is not lost because the user is forced to confront their real-life environment in the middle of an experience. Experiences also that allow the user to actively interact with different sensory modalities such as sound, light, pressure. And as the VR develops further, um, smell and taste as well will create more perspectival fidelity. AR experiences have a different design space given the nature of the technology. For example, AR experiences being superimposed on reality means that the way users experience sounds, movement, sensory info, will be formed by this synthesis of virtual and real information. So it's important for developers of VR and AR to consider the way that users will interact with their medium when building experiences. We see perspectival fidelity as a dimensional property, meaning that certain experiences can be less or more perspectively faithful. In this third case, we see that the lack of first person's perspective, the video game overlay, and a soundtrack apart from diegetic sound all reduce the perspectival fidelity of the experience. Another key aspect of VR and AR, which leads the technologies to ultimately warrant a particular code of ethics like we've proposed, is something called context realism. Context realism is the extent to which a simulated world and its inhabitants behave in accordance with our expectations, how believable a world is. A simulation which places us in a world that behaves like ours with virtual agents that react according to reasonable expectations will have more context realism than a simulation which does not. So in short, the more a simulation looks, feels, and acts like a real world, the higher in context realism it is. Simulations which are high in both perspectival fidelity and context realism have the potential to yield something we'll call virtually real experiences. Virtually real experiences are unique because both of the features, context realism and perspectival fidelity, work in hand to generate them. An experience is virtually real if the user responds to that experience both behaviorally and uh, physiologically as though it were really happening. It has been argued that because of the high potential for AR and VR developers to create these virtually real experiences, developers should adopt something called the equivalence principle, which states, if it would be wrong to allow a person to have an experience of something in the real world, then it would be wrong to allow a person access to a virtually real analog of that experience. As the simulation's likelihood of inducing virtually real experiences increases, so too should the ethical justification for the development and use of the simulation.
In light of our research, we have proposed a code of ethics for VR and AR. I would like to draw your attention to the statements highlighted in orange, which include designing simulations to avoid making them more likely to produce virtually real experiences than necessary, the equivalence principle to set a upper limit on ethically acceptable VR AR applications, applications intended to change or nudge user behavior must be transparent, avoid manipulation, and serve both the user and public's good. And finally, being mindful that content not problematic using traditional media may become problematic in VR and AR if the content is experienced as virtually real. In the interest of time, we're going to focus on the orange statements from our code of ethics. Now we'll transition to the application of our code. So one case where we think it's very important to apply this kind of a code comes in the form of virtual reality-based nudges. So a nudge is an intentional design element that aims at changing the user's behavior uh, when given a choice context. So common examples of nudges include things like warning signs, reminders, or even GPS navigators, which push the user to a certain route with audio or visual cues. Another good example is the pinging seatbelt reminder to remind you to put on your seatbelt when you get in a car. It allows you to go your own way and disobey it, but it's a reminder there to try to inculcate some kind of positive outcome. Uh, for a nudge to be ethically sound, it must maintain transparency, avoid manipulating the user, and promote the user's welfare from their own perspective. When it comes to VR simulations that are meant to nudge the user, extra care is required because of how radically immersive the technology is. Designers must be especially cautious to avoid deceiving their users. A quick example comes from empathy enhancing experiences, which aim at placing the user into a virtually real context that they simply could not experience otherwise. However, due to the technological and psychological limitations on empathizing, they deserve special scrutiny. The image on the right is from I am a man, an experience which aims to give the user a virtually real experience of being discriminated against for the color of their skin. While this experience might be able to tell us something meaningful about social issues, it's probably a mistake to say that it gives the user an accurate, virtually real experience of being a person of color in the United States of America. To prevent from deceiving the user into thinking otherwise, special care should be taken. Again, another uh, way we would like to apply it is that because of their ability to generate uh, virtually real experiences, the actual content of AR and VR simulations should be approached more conservatively. Content that users might find unproblematic when experienced through conventional media like TV or video games may become problematic in AR or VR. One could imagine all sorts of subject matter that is traditionally found in narratives that use long established hardware, which would be traumatic or harmful to a user if they were to experience it in a virtually real setting. Because of this, designers should keep perspectival fidelity and context realism in mind to help mitigate undesirable user experiences. So you can see in the quote that's been included here, one VR developer, Scott Steffen, said that certain experiences like horror experiences need to be really finely calibrated. Certain things that might be fun on a television or in a theater become downright terrifying when translated into a virtually real experience. So how should developers approach this problem? Well, the calibration that Stefan is referring to here can be carried out uh, by paying mind to and altering the amount of context realism and perspectival fidelity in a simulation uh, has designed into it. Uh, so an image that we've used here is a, a rather spooky one from Resident Evil 7 VR, a game published by Capcom. Since we're viewing this image on a screen, screen <laughs> on a screen, it's pretty easy to abstract away from any potential perception of danger. However, we could imagine that in VR, it would actually be quite scary. By including things like background music, heads up displays, an ammo counter, or other features which would change the level of context realism and perspectival fidelity, it's likely that it would be uh, easier for the user to have the kind of fun scare that the developers intend when designing the experience, rather than a survival scare, as Stefan calls it. On the other hand, VR can be harnessed ethically to generate real experiences, for example, for the purposes of training. For instance, virtual reality exposure therapy, or VRET, highly depends on perspectival fidelity and context realism for realizing therapeutic results. Walmart has also established management training for their employees to help team members efficiently learn customer service and skills-based training in VR. 
Finally, CSU VR uses VR for anti-harassment training. Their product, the Empower Now program, allows users to play simulations based on real field cases, such as victim, perpetrator, or observer. Additionally, users can learn how to confront, escape, or intervene using their voice to help them internalize their learnings from the training. So in short, we think that there are a lot of interesting applications for building in ethics into, into the workflow of virtual reality and augmented reality applications that become especially powerful when once you take into account how users experience simulated content, especially with respect to design elements like perspectival fidelity and context realism. We wanna thank you for your time and attention. Once again, we wanna thank uh, the organizers of the conference for all of the hard work going on behind the scenes. And we look forward to uh, engaging the rest of you with uh, questions. Please feel free to get in touch with any of us uh, with our contact info here. And I also wanted to acknowledge, as you can see on the slide, sources of funding that make this research possible. Thank you again.